Hey, welcome back. Today we are talking again about Beowulf, and we are talking about the section after Beowulf returns home in lines 2200 to lines 2500. And in this section, we're going to have a huge leap forward in time and get a lot of intermittent backstory, filling in the gaps. We introduce a new monster and we flash forward and back. The very first thing that we do is get a quick recap of what's happened for the last 50 or more years. Higelac falls in battle and the throne eventually passes to Beowulf, who then rules for 50 very good years. He ruled it well for 50 winters grew old and wise as warden of the land, until one began to dominate the dark, a dragon on the prowl, from the steep vaults of a stone-roofed barrow, where he guarded a horde. There was a hidden passage unknown to men, but someone managed to enter by it and interfere with the heathen trove. He handled it and removed a gem-studded goblet, it gained him nothing, though with a thief's wiles he outwitted the sleeping dragon that drove him into a rage, as the people of that country would soon discover. This is one of the biggest tragedies of the story of Beowulf, in that this particular section of the poem, the one manuscript that they have in existence was very deteriorated on this page. And if you look at the Anglo-Saxon portion, you can see that there are lots of ellipses showing missing sections because of the deterioration of this particular manuscript. And this is especially tragic because this is the introduction of one of the most interesting monsters. And it feels very, very symbolic. But a lot of the potential keys to the symbolism really rest within this damaged section. What is it that the dragon represents or means? Well, we get a vague story about a runaway slave or servant who stumbles upon the dragon's den. Most of the details are very sketchy because they've worn away with the faded manuscript. But somehow this thief goes down inside the dragon's hollow, finds the treasure, removes a cup, and brings it back to his master. It says, the intruder who broached the dragon's treasure and moved him to wrath had never meant to. It was desperation on the part of a slave fleeing the heavy hand of some master, guilt-ridden and on the run, going to ground. And we get this section which is mostly, mostly ruined, which would have described the, the servant or slave creeping through the dragon's lair and stepping close to the dragon's head on accident. And this section fades into a description of some ancient clan that had amassed all of this wealth. And they had been very powerful, but then they began to die out. Again, the details here are somewhat worn away, and so we're not entirely sure what this clan was. Is this another story about the idea of greatness and leadership that has deteriorated down to nothing? In any case, the last remaining survivor of this race of people, of this clan, is sitting alone on this big pile of treasure. And we see the hollowness and the emptiness of amassing great wealth, but losing all that you have, losing your people. And we're reminded of the Rekka trope. The outcast all alone without a people. In any case, this one remaining survivor is sitting on this huge hoard of treasure, but it does him no good. He's all alone. And as he's sitting there alone, he says, Now earth, hold what earls once held, and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first by honorable men. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or burnish plated goblets, put a sheen on the cup. The companies have departed. The hard helmet hasped with gold will be stripped of its hoops, and the helmet shiner who should polish the metal of the war mask sleeps, the coat of mail that come through all fights, through shield collapse and cut of sword, decays with the warrior. Nor may webbed mail range far and wide on the warlord's back beside his mustered troops. No trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall, no swift horse pawing at the courtyard. Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. And so he mourned as he moved about the world, deserted and alone, 
lamenting his unhappiness day and night until death's flood brimmed up in his heart. And so this treasure, which couldn't save its people and left the last survivor all alone and broken, becomes a lure that draws in this dragon, this great heror of the dark, it says, comes and finds this treasure and curls up on top of it and becomes a treasure guardian. And so throughout the book, treasure and wealth are associated with the opportunity to express generosity. When you have great wealth and great treasure, if you give it to people, you show good leadership skills. When you hoard it and sit on it, clearly that's a dangerous thing. And Hrothgar warned against greed and selfishness back in our last episode. And the dragon seems to be in part, at least, the potential for that greediness, for that lust for gold that leads people to destruction. And this thief who steals the golden cup thinks that he can buy his freedom and buy his escape. But what he does is wake up the dragon, this dark destroyer. Not only is the dragon associated with the idea of greed and the destructive force of greed, but he's also very serpentine. And in just a moment, we're going to associate him potentially with uh, the idea of evil incarnate. When the dragon awoke, trouble flared again. He rippled down the rock, writhing with anger. When he saw the footprints of the prowler who had stolen too close to his dreaming head. So may a man not marked by fate easily escape exile and woe by the grace of God. The horde guardian scorched the ground as he scoured and hunted for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. Hot and savage, he kept circling and circling the outside of the mound. No man appeared in that desert waste, but he worked himself up by imagining battle. Then back he'd go in search of the cup, only to discover signs that someone had stumbled upon his golden treasures. So the guardian of the mound, the horde watcher, waited for the gloaming with fierce impatience. His pent-up fury at the loss of the vessel made him long to hit back and lash out in flames. Then, to his delight, the day waned, and he could wait no longer behind the wall, but hurtled forth in a fiery blaze. The first to suffer were the people of the land, but before long it was their treasure giver who would come to grief. There are so many fantastic kinnings about the dragon. He's called the Guardian of the Mound, the Horde Watcher. Later on, he's going to be called Skywinger and Sky Plague. And he begins to burn down the whole countryside, all of Geatland, including Beowulf's own hall. And Beowulf responds to this. In line 2324, it says, Then Beowulf was given bad news, a hard truth. His own home, the best of buildings, had been burnt to a cinder, the throne room of the Geats. It threw the hero into deep anguish and darkened his mood. The wise man thought he must have thwarted ancient ordinance of the eternal Lord, broken his commandment. His mind was in turmoil. Unaccustomed anxiety and gloom confused his brain. The fire dragon had raised the coastal region and reduced forts and earthworks to dust and ashes. So the war king planned and plotted his revenge. And so Beowulf begins to wonder if he's done something wrong, if he's offended God somehow. We have the idea of providence there, but also there's that sense of win. Beowulf has been ruling happily for 50 years, and all of a sudden this destruction comes up that is unexpected. Was Beowulf prepared for this? Or was he struck like Hrothgar by Grindel? Well, there are a lot of possible clues here. He's careful to examine himself, as we've seen him do in the past, and look at himself and look at his own weaknesses without recognizing his own limitations or the power, ultimately, of God. And so he begins to plan. He makes a shield, not out of wood, but out of metal, to make sure that he's able to block the dragon fire. But right in the midst of this, we get a clear statement of what's going to happen. Foreshadowing. That same foreshadowing we've seen throughout the poem so far. After many trials, he was destined to face the end of his days in this mortal world, as was the dragon, for all his long leasehold on the treasure. So, we get a real big spoiler right before we even really begin to prepare for the battle. Beowulf and the dragon are both going to die in this fight. You don't need to expect anything else. And so because we know the end of the story, we know what's going to happen in this next big fight, it's all been spoiled for us, we focus instead on the way Beowulf approaches and meets his end. Is he still the kind of hero that he was when he was young? Has he overcome the problems of leadership? Has he truly become his full potential? In order to answer that question, we have to see, one, how he approaches the dragon, two, how he has ruled over the past several years, 
and three, what his path to power looked like. And so it begins to tell us of Beowulf's preparation for the dragon. It says, the Prince of Rings was too proud to line up with a large army against the Sky Plague. He had scant regard for the dragon as a threat, no dread at all of its courage or strength, for he had kept going often in the past, through perils and ordeals of every sort. After he had purged Hrothgar's hall, triumphed in Herat, and beaten Grendel, he outgrappled the monster and his evil kin. So he's done a lot of heroic things in the past, and he believes in his own heroism. He believes in his own prowess and his ability to face monsters. Does that mean he's lost his perspective? Well, let's keep an eye on it. It then jumps to one particular encounter he had, which is an example of his prowess, but it's also part of the story of what has brought him here, his path to power. And that is the battle which led to the death of Higelac. We saw a foreshadowing of it back in Herat when he was receiving the necklace, but now we get the story as a flashback. Higelac fell to the Frisians, and Beowulf was there but could not save Higelac. However, Beowulf did manage to decimate the Frisians and carry back 30 suits of armor as he swam across the ocean. So he was able to pay them back for killing his beloved king. Then comes an incredibly important part, which I think epitomizes the kind of heroism that Beowulf shows. Across the wide sea, desolate and alone, the son of Egthel swam back to his people. There, Higd offered him throne and authority as Lord of the Ringhorde. With Higelac dead, she had no belief in her son's ability to defend their homeland against foreign invaders. There was no way the weakened nation could get Beowulf to give in and agree to be elevated over Heardred as his lord or to undertake the office of kingship. But he did provide support for the prince, honored and minded him until he matured as the ruler of Geatland. And so after Higelac's death, the queen, Higelac's wife, Queen Higd, remember we heard about her before, we heard about her nobility, we heard about her clear-mindedness. She says, after her husband dies, that Beowulf should take the throne over her own son. She sees the kind of ruler that Beowulf is and says, you are the better king for Geatland. And yet, what does Beowulf do? He doesn't see a kingdom as something to grasp at. He doesn't see it as something to struggle to obtain. Instead, he says, no, Heardred is the rightful heir. I will follow him. And I know he's young, and I know he's weak, but I will support him and take care of him. So Heardred, the weakling prince, who has poor decision-making, is still put in his rightful place on the throne, and Beowulf becomes the wise mentor, the hero who stands up and continues to protect the people and to protect his own king. But he doesn't grasp at kingship. Of course, Heardred doesn't last too long because he gets involved in the battles with the Swedes. We've heard about the Swedes in the past, we've seen the tension between the Geats and the Swedes, and ultimately this leads to Heardred's death. And after the death of Heardred, Beowulf is now the only viable ruler. And so, in order to do his duty towards the royal family that is now dead, and his duty towards Gateland, Beowulf takes the throne. He defeats the Swedes, including Onella, who is, if you remember, married into Hrothgar's family, Mary's Hrothgar's sister. And so now here they are gathering together, ready to fight the dragon. And there's a few interesting details in here. And so the son of Egthiel had survived every extreme, excelling himself in daring and in danger, until the day arrived when he had come face to face with the dragon. The Lord of the Geats took eleven comrades and went in a rage to reconnoiter. By then he had discovered the cause of the affliction being visited on his people. The precious cup had come to him from the hand of the finder, the one who had started all this strife, and was now added as the thirteenth to their number. They press-ganged and compelled this poor creature to be their guide. Against his will, he led them to the earth vault he alone knew, an underground barrow near the sea billows and heaving waves heaped inside with exquisite metalwork. The one who stood guard was dangerous and watchful, warden of that trove buried under the earth, no easy bargain would be made in that place by any man. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next episode when we talk more about the dragon, but there are clear hints towards Beowulf as a Christ figure. Here he is as someone who is going to go up against the dragon, and the dragon and the serpent have long been symbols or images for Satan and for evil. 
And we get another little interesting detail here, in the sense that he has 12 comrades, 11 good friends, and one traitor, which might remind us of the 12 disciples, one of whom was a traitor. The traitor is the one who started all of this, who woke the dragon and stole the cup. We're also going to see some other echoes as well of Christianity. Is this the Christian poet superimposing Christian symbolism on top of an old story of heroism? It's very possible. He's not excessively explicit about it, but there is definitely enough there to be able to draw some interesting conclusions. But before we go into battle, we're going to hear one more speech from Beowulf. And again, it's going to fill in some of the background details. The veteran king sat down on the clifftop. He wished good luck to the Geats who had shared his hearth and his goal. He was sad at heart, unsettled, yet ready, sensing his death. His fate hovered near, unknowable but certain. He would soon claim his coffered soul, part life from limb. Before long, the prince's spirit would spin free from his body. Again, if you didn't catch that first reference, we clearly have Weird coming to get him. His doom is nigh, and even Beowulf seems to know it. And so he goes back to his childhood and tells the story of himself as a very young man. When he was seven years old, he was fostered by his father, and King Higelac's father, King Hrethel, raised him and took care of him. Things were going well until one of the sons of King Hrethel, Haethsen, accidentally killed his older brother, Haribeld. And the kin killing, the brother killing, which has been a recurring kind of image and motif throughout this story, haunts and troubles the family of King Higelac. King Hrethel is a broken man by watching one of his sons be killed by another, even though it was an accident. There's this deeply moving long simile at this point. It was like the misery felt by an old man who has lived to see his son's body swing on the gallows. He begins to keen and weep for his boy, watching the raven gloat where he hangs. He can be of no help. The wisdom of age is worthless to him. Morning after morning he wakes to remember that his child is gone. He has no interest in living on until another heir is born in the hall, now that his firstborn has entered death's dominion forever. He gazes sorrowfully at his son's dwelling, the banquet hall bereft of all delight, the wind-swept hearthstone, the horsemen are sleeping, the warriors underground, what was is no more. No tunes from the harp, no cheer raised in the yard, alone with his longing he lies down on his bed and sings a lament. Everything seems too large, the steadings and the fields. Such was the feeling of loss endured by the Lord of the Geats after Haribeld's death. He was helplessly placed to set to right the wrongs committed, could not punish the killer in accordance with the law of the blood feud, although he felt no love for him. Heart sore, wearied, he turned away from life's joys, chose God's light and departed, leaving buildings and lands to his sons as a man of substance will. This heartbreaking story about a man who loses his son to shame, to death on the gallows. And every day as he wakes up and he laments because not only is his son dead, but also he's dead in a shameful kind of way, something that can never be righted or never fixed. It's a heartbreaking mark on them forever. Like the mark of Cain that we saw in Grendel, like the mark on Unferth. And yet after Hrethel passes away, Higelac is given the throne, and we know that Higelac is a good king. Then Beowulf sums up the feuds back and forth between the Geats and the Swedes, how Beowulf served under Higelac and fought against the Swedes over and over and over again. And Beowulf proved himself again and again throughout these battles, and now he's become this great hero who's ready to go face the dragon and he makes his last formal boast. Just as he made a big boast before fighting Grendel, as he made a big boast before fighting Grendel's mother, it says, Beowulf spoke, made his formal boast for the last time. I risked my life often when I was young. Now I am old, but as king of the people, I shall pursue this fight for the glory of winning, if the evil one will only abandon his earth fort and face me in the open. Then he addressed each dear companion one final time, those fighters in their helmets, resolute and highborn. I would rather not use a weapon. If I knew another way to grapple with the dragon, make good my boast, as I did against Grendel in days gone by. But I shall be meeting molten venom in the fire he breathes, so I go forth in mail shirt and shield. 
I won't shift a foot when I meet the cave guard. What occurs on the wall between the two of us will turn out as fate. Overseer of men decides. I am resolved. I scorn further wor words against the Skyborn foe. He says, you know, if I could go out without a sword and fight him man to man, I would. But because he breathes fire, you know, that's impossible. Still, whatever Weird determines after this is what's going to happen. I'm going to face him. He then turns to his men and says, Men at arms, remain here on the barrow, safe in your armor, to see which one of us is better in the end at bearing wounds in a deadly fray. The fight is not yours, nor it is up to any man except me to measure his strength against the monster or to prove his worth. I shall win the gold by my courage, or else mortal combat, doom of battle, will bear your lord away. Again, he recognizes the weird here. He recognizes that ultimately he will do his best and whatever comes will come. And he tells the men, you all wait here. I'm going to go fight the dragon. What is the fight going to be like? That's what we're going to look at in our next episode. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another episode. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye. And it's all very exciting.